Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Harambe. Tonight, we start off our program with a few rhetorical questions. Are liberals dominating the media as neoconservatives such as Rush Limbaugh would have us to believe? Is the press really skewed towards the liberal end? What kind of coverage are African Americans receiving in a print and broadcast media, and what kind of visual images are we accustomed to seeing coming out of Africa? Well, tonight we offer you a critique of the news media through the eyes of Media Watchdog Group, Fairness and Accuracy in Reporting. And as Russ Limbaugh found out recently, not only does FAIR render blistering critiques, they also document their work. We pick up our conversation with FAIR's research director, Janine Jackson. FAIR is a media watch group, and what that means is we do media criticism and media activism, a little bit of both. Our products, if you will, are a magazine called Extra, which comes out bi-monthly, and a nationally syndicated radio show called Counterspin. So what we do, our, what we see our mission to be is, is educating the public about imbalance and bias in mainstream news media. We don't look at entertainment media so much, but news media. We look for biases, imbalances, variety of sources, and basically we're trying to encourage media pluralism. We want there to be available for people a variety of perspectives on the news and on world events. So we monitor the news media and look for those sorts of things. We're also an anti-censorship group. Uh, which means that when journalists find themselves in a situation where they can't write uh, a story they want to write because they're being told it's too critical, it's too hot, when journalists are fired for critical reporting, we champion that cause as well. We don't have a political affiliation uh, formally at all. Um, we, I mean, as to whether we consider ourselves a political group, we do to some extent because media questions and who gets heard and who isn't heard in the mainstream news media do often turn on political questions. But our critique is really a journalistic critique. Mm -hmm. Just how much bias or unfairness is there currently in the print and broadcast media? Well. I think we don't see the kinds of overt bias that, that people might imagine you know, we're talking about. We don't hear racist terms openly used by news anchors and that sort of thing. When we talk about imbalance in the media, we're really talking about the variety of perspectives that people get to hear. And on that front, I think there's a, quite a serious problem with imbalance. Um, what we find is that uh, in part due to the corporate ownership of media and the fact that corporations are the main sponsors of the news media, we find it very difficult for any points of view that might be construed as being anti-corporate. That can be labor groups, environmentalists, people who are just critical of the political status quo. These sorts of people who we believe we ought to hear from, we don't hear from. We've both heard the allegation or the term Eastern liberal bias or Eastern liberal press. Is the press really skewed towards the liberal end? Well, I think when most people talk about a liberal bias in the media, they're saying, I think Dan Rather, I think uh, Diane Sawyer, those people look like Democrats to me, uh, or liberals to me. They're talking about the reporters and what they imagine to be their personal biases. And if you look at things that way, you may find, as a poll, I think done last year in 93, found that many reporters and editors voted democratically in the elections. If that, to your mind, means liberal, then you can say these reporters are liberals. But truthfully, the opinions of the reporters are not the greatest influence on what we see on the news. Much more important are the sources that appear in the news. Who is being quoted? Who is the expert? Who is being brought on to explain a situation? When you examine the sources, which is what we do at FAIR, you find that they are overwhelmingly right of center or conservative uh, individuals or institutions, think tanks and so on, or centrists, you know, in the center. And um, this is a point of view we take which many people don't quite get, but I think is worth saying, is that being a centrist also represents a bias. A centrist is, are, are, centrists are those who believe that the political and the economic and the social status quo is good. You don't want to change it. Everything's working fine. Um, 
that's a point of view. That's a point on the, on the spectrum of political opinions. Uh, it's not neutral, in other words. It's not halfway between left and right. It's a point of view in its own right. So when we look at the sources, what we find is that the spectrum of opinion is from center to right, with progressives or the left very infrequently heard from. And we think that that bias is actually the most influential. Uh, let's talk about public television, uh, which is where I'm at. Uh, your organization has been a consistent and actually relentless critic of public TV. In fact, you wrote an article in the September-October edition of your publication, Extra, entitled, If PBS Can't Be Reformed, It Should Be Replaced. What's wrong with public TV as it stands now, and what changes would your organization like to be made? Well, let's start by saying that uh, PBS and public broadcasting in general does excellent work. Um, the local affiliates, often that's where you see the most interesting programming that's on television. And particularly in cultural areas, entertainment areas, historical areas, we see programming on public broadcasting that we really don't see anywhere else. For us, the main weakness lies in the, the political or public affairs programming on PBS. And there, I guess how badly you think it's doing depends on how high your hopes were for it to begin with. I keep thinking, we refer constantly to the Carnegie Commission report that established public broadcasting. And there they say that the goal is to provide a voice for those in the community who might otherwise be unheard and to be a forum for controversy and debate. It's when we judge PBS by those standards that we find it really, really wanting. And I, and I can, the areas that we mainly focus on, look at the talk shows, for example. You can see John McLaughlin, you know, arch conservative. You can see Bill Buckley. There is no weekly regular program on public broadcasting with a host who is a progressive, with a host who takes anything slightly left of center as a point of view, with a host who's critical, in other words, of some of the things going on in the country. We think that's something that PBS ought to provide if it's really going to be a forum for controversy and debate. And then we also have done a couple of studies of sources on public affairs programming on PBS. And what we find is that it just looks too much like the networks. We see the same corporate and administrative officials being brought on as experts as we see elsewhere in the news. So it doesn't seem that PBS is really providing an alternative to commercial broadcasting. And that's, after all, what it was established to do. And then in the areas of documentaries, PBS has shown themselves. And I'm talking about national PBS. Local affiliates do a good job, some of it national stuff, some of it their own programming. And they vary widely in quality around the country. But when we talk about national PBS and the shows they consider important and fund and distribute, we find that in the area of documentaries, PBS is very hesitant about doing anything that might be controversial. They've rejected a lot of programming because they think it's too hot. To our mind, that's exactly what they should not be doing. Public broadcasting ought to be in the business of getting critical ideas out there, getting the ideas out there that wouldn't be carried on the corporate sponsored or the commercial networks. That's what its role should be if it's going to be worthy of getting public funding. And it's not doing that. And we're going to pause here for a moment because as is tradition, it's time to give you a chance to test your knowledge of history. It's time for our monthly feature, Black Facts. Recently, uh, Fair took on Rush Limbaugh. Uh, they took him to task in what was a scorching article in your publication, uh, Extra, entitled Rush Limbaugh's Reign of Error. 
Uh, in that article, uh, Janine Fair wrote, quote, no one in the history of national television has had such a political platform, unquote. Can you elaborate on that point? Well, what's striking about Rush Limbaugh is that he, he calls himself an entertainer, but if you watch his television show or if you listen to his radio show, you find out that what they really are are political sermons. He really is delivering opinions specifically about the Clintons, but really about economic policy and everything else, the news of the day. What's, and that's, you know, that's not that he shouldn't, but it's not just entertainment, strictly speaking. And the trouble with the format is that he doesn't have anyone to counter him. He doesn't bring guests on the program, or only very rarely. There's no one who might disagree with him. On his radio show, where he takes live callers, they're very carefully screened so that people who are directly critical of Mr. Limbaugh or of his opinions rarely, if ever, get on the air. So it's really the fact that he is uncontested um, you know, offering these political sermons day after day that piqued our interest. But then in that report, it's not, well, we're not taking issue with his personality, really, or even his politics, really. That report focuses on the accuracy of his statements. Because uh, if you're going to deliver yourself of your opinions in a regular way, in an inf influential way, it's our belief that you ought to at least correct errors when he says things like nicotine has not been proven to be addictive, you know, or when he says things like, well, banks take a risk when they issue student loans, so they're entitled to the profit. Well, no, actually, student loans are federally insured, so, you know, banks don't take a risk. He offers, you know, there were no indictments in the Iran-Contra hearings. It was just a waste of public time because there weren't even any indictments. He says something like this, if you don't know the background, you may accept that and then go on to believe whatever he's going to offer after that. But as a matter of fact, there were indictments in the Iran-Contra hearings. There were 14 of them, and people went to jail. You know? So our question is, you know, if he's going to correct himself, if he's going to acknowledge when he makes mistakes, then let him be as you know, offensive. You know, we would never call, in other words, we're an anti-censorship group. We would never call for Rush Limbaugh to be off the air. Our, our concern is that, yes, there ought to be room for someone to be up there offering a, a critical point of view just as loudly, just as persuasively. Well, Mr. Limbaugh doesn't seem to be at a loss for corporate sponsorship. Do you think it's possible, Janine, for someone from the liberal or progressive uh, wing or pro pro progressive uh, persuasion to get corporate interest to support uh, them in a similar program? Well, excellent question. I mean, uh, Rush Limbaugh always, often claims he's going to be censored. You know, they're trying to get him off the air because he's too strong or whatever. But what I would like to see is if Limbaugh came out one day and instead of attacking homeless people and, and black people and women or feminists, if instead he turned his beam on corporate, uh, on corporations who pollute the environment or who engage in environmental racism or who don't hire minorities, et cetera, if they became the targets uh, of his anger and if he did it in just as persuasive and you know, funny or, and strong a manner, I would be very interested to see how long he would last. His, his targets, for the most part, are the least powerful sectors in society. And I think that there are many people who are more comfortable with that than they would be if he attacked someone else. So, I mean, my belief is no, there could not be, uh, there certainly wouldn't be corporate money for someone who really was going to be attacking the sources of power in this country. Let me give you a scenario. Currently, if you were running for public office, I could not invite you on our program unless you were offered, we offered uh, your opponents equal on-air time. Of course, Rush Limbaugh is not running for political office yet. Mm -hmm. Yet, it is certainly accurate to say, I think, that he is at minimum acting as a conduit uh, for the politically neoconservative right. Are we witnessing a skirting of the equal time laws here? Well, I think that's an interesting question. I mean, as a, as a rule, FAIR as an organization and myself as an individual would be opposed to government intervention to sort of even the playing field. There, people like to believe that you simply encourage all kinds of ideas and you know you should, the government shouldn't have to intervene because who knows what they'll do if they do. Having said that, the fact that the media is owned by an ever smaller group of individuals and corporations 
means that they really can control it in a certain way. And when you have someone who's kind of quasi-political, like Rush Limbaugh, it can amount to what you're, what you're saying, a kind of a political point of view, but without the equal time provision. So I think the fairness doctrine, which is being considered just to deal with just that issue, is something we ought to take a look at. Um, there may be something to be said for the designation of certain shows, which are definitely political, you know, to, ha to have an answer. But I would like to stop short of that. What I would really like to see is a variety of programs being allowed to exist which represent lots of different political points of view. I would like to not have us have to resort to legislation, in other words, to make this happen, to get this plurality of political voices out there. Give me some examples of racism in the media. When pundits or experts are talking about Haiti and they say, as was said on the McLaughlin group just two Sundays ago, well, you know, those people are primitive, backward, you know. This is... Um, Morton Kondracki, I believe, on, on the McLaughlin group. You, we hear terms that are OK to use when you're talking about black people, either here or in another country, that are just not OK when directed at white people. And that's something we need to be concerned about. Um, we, there are language differences. For example, here in New York, we've compared stories that were talking about protests in different neighborhoods. We found that when young black men were marching in Crown Heights, they were described in the newspaper as a roving mob. Um, however, when a group of young white men who were at a police rally were drinking beer and turning over cars, the New York Times describes them as protesters. You know, who's a roving mob and who are protesters? It's this kind of language which may be subtle, but which shows up in lots of different ways. African Americans are portrayed in news media overwhelmingly stereotypically. And the main way that happens is, and I think anybody when they watch their local news sees this, um, blacks in this country are covered overwhelmingly in the context of crime. Uh, when you see African American people on the news, it's not even a joke to say they are almost always in handcuffs, being led away, you know. Um, that is deeply, deeply troubling. Obviously, it inf influences the opinions and the worldviews of everybody who's watching it, including African Americans who only see themselves on television in a criminal context. You know, it would not be difficult for news shows that wanted to to find African-American economists to talk about Wall Street, to find African-American scientists to talk about the environmental news. In other words, to reflect the range of, of people that exist occupationally, personally, et cetera. That's possible, but they don't do that. And that goes back to understaffing, to underrepresentation of African-Americans in decision-making roles, as I say. But it also is, is plain old racism, you know. Um, there was a study done that compared coverage in Boston uh, of the two of two neighborhoods, Roxbury and Mattapan, two primarily African American communities. Compared the coverage those communities got from black-owned media and from the mainstream white media, and the main finding of the study was not that black-owned media didn't talk about crime in those communities. They did. It was just that they also talked about other things. They Such all, as? They also made a story when a new school opened. They, they did a story about uh, coalitions coming together to clean up the streets. They did stories about um, grant-giving organizations that were going to give money to local groups. They showed a range, you know, ribbon cuttings, parades, the variety of life that a community has. Uh, the white-owned media did not do that. So it's not an argument that when crime happens and it's in a black neighborhood, you shouldn't cover it. It's that you need to make an effort to really reflect uh, the community as it is, which is diverse and interesting and succeeding and interested in success, and not rely on these old stereotyp stereotypical images that we've been fighting for years. Mm -hmm. What about coverage of Africa? Well, there, it's uh, an interesting fact which says a lot is that there are more U.S. reporters covering the New York Yankees than there are covering the entire continent of Africa. And that tells you something about the priorities of the news media in this country. There are very few reporters who know Africa, who know the history. Um, and that contributes to a different kind of racism, which is when we hear about Rwanda, for example, and the impression we get is, oh, those people are killing themselves again. 
you know, those people are just killing each other again. It's just, um, you know, black people, tribal, savagery, all these images get conjured up again because the reporters don't bother to give the history, to give the political context. We, Somalia, oh, more starving black people. You know, it's as if you don't really need to know the particular history. You don't need to know the unique situation of that country because it's all kind of alike. You know, every, every country in Africa, it's, it's kind of alike. They're kind of backward, and that's all you need to know. That's laziness, you know, uh, at, to put the best face on it. Uh, of reporters to not bother to give the history like they would in uh, Bosnia, for example. And, by, and just as a footnote, when have we heard about, uh, when have you heard the conflict in former Yugoslavia described as white on white crime? You know, there's kind of a notion that uh, black on black is kind of, to me, conjures up, well, these people can't even get along with each other, you know. Um, but white on white is not something that means anything to anybody. Mm. It's similar you know? to mean like uh, the reference to ethnic fighting in Bosnia right. as opposed to tribal Yes, warfare. exactly, exactly. These are all things that subtly or not influence your understanding of the situation. You know, I think there's just a presumption on the part of the news media that people are, their audience is of European descent and Europe is what they want to hear about. You know, black people and African Americans are just not the audience that news media is generally aimed at. And so Africa doesn't get anything like the kind of coverage it should. Your organization wrote a piece a couple of years ago surrounding the whole issue of affirmative action and the discourse that has taken place uh, in the media around that controversial issue. Why don't you uh, elaborate on that? Well, what we find with affirmative action and with a number of issues is that a certain point of view comes to carry the day. You know, a certain phrase gets taken over and uh, then all questions are, are answered. With affirmative action, the, the point of view that won the day was the conservative point of view that it was a quota system. I mean, it's quota and affirmative action are pretty much tossed, are interchanged freely in the media. And that's, of course, a misrepresentation. And also that affirmative action was designed to deal with past inequalities. And so that while there may have been a need for it in the past, there just isn't anymore. This opinion we, is kind of the, the basic opinion you get when you read the news media. Uh, we hear a lot about, I mean, as much coverage is given to instances of so-called reverse discrimination as is given to plain old discrimination, which suggests that they're equal problems. You know, For that point of view to have carried the day, that racism is a thing of the past, that affirmative action is about quotas, you know, and that bias against whites is just as serious as bias against blacks, that could only happen. That opinion could only carry the day if you're in a situation where black people, uh, progressive people, left of center people are not being heard. Because if they were out there, people would have heard all the arguments that make nonsense of that opinion. It makes a difference when an editor makes a choice to say the quota bill, you know, um, or to take a politician's language like George Bush's who called a quota bill and to use that without giving some real background. It also misrepresents um, who are the beneficiaries of affirm affirmative action. When the nightly news does a story on affirmative action, and no matter what they say, the pictures they show are all of African Americans, you may get the idea that African Americans have been the primary beneficiaries of affirmative action laws when, in fact, white women have been the primary beneficiaries in terms of hirings and promotions. So the media can go a long way towards influencing our understanding of something this important. I think there's also an example here of some good media, uh, which does happen. Primetime Live did a show years ago, um, really only two years ago, maybe 92, in which they showed they had a hidden camera and they showed equally qualified, uh, equally groomed and dressed, black man and a white man, and they showed them going to try to get an apartment, going to be hired for a job. They, this was a test case. They made sure they were equal on every count except race. They showed them again and again the black man being turned down, turned away from apartments, turned down for jobs, couldn't even get a cab on the street. This was something, this was real media here, you know, this was unadulterated, and this was telling people that racism is not a problem of the past, it's a problem of the present.
And whether or not you think affirmative action is the best answer to correct it, there obviously is a need for affirmative action. And this was an example of a news media doing what news media ought to do, debunking what may have become conventional wisdom because it doesn't jibe with the reality. So what is the bottom line about how we should approach the broadcast and print media? People should recognize that you have to watch media critically. I think we're used to imagining that the news is kind of a neutral conduit, that we're just learning about what's happening in the world. And that simply isn't the case. You have to watch critically. You have to read the newspaper critically. Look at who the sources are. Ask yourself, who am I not hearing from in this story? They talked to the Defense Department. They talked to the White House. Who did they not talk to? Um, are the sources unnamed? What does it mean when a source doesn't give their name and they can't therefore be checked up on? But I think the important thing is to consider what's not being heard, to consider that the people who are offering their opinions may have reasons for giving the opinions they give, and to keep that in mind not to rely on a single source, perhaps. You can read the paper, you can learn from the paper, but maybe you want to read two or three different papers and see how they differ and you know, consider those perspectives together. But watch the news critically.